Hello, hello. How's everybody doing this morning? All right. It's Wednesday. It's podcast day. So today's episode number 14. The podcast is officially a teenager. <laughs> Today we're talking about food. We're talking about eating for stress and anxiety. So the last few weeks we've been talking about the three pillars of my system for freedom from anxiety. We talked about mindset. We talked about habits. And we talked about lifestyle. We talked about lifestyle kind of as an overview. And these next few episodes of the podcast, we're going to go into each, maybe not all of them, but most of them, we're going to talk about each of these lifestyle elements. And the, the first one, probably the most basic, the most obvious to talk about was food and nutrition. So we're going to cover a few drinks today as well, um, but it's going to be mostly about food. And um, yeah, let's dig into it, right? So before we get started, I guess... I made an awesome downloadable guide for you, which includes some things to avoid. It includes some great alternatives if one of your favorites is on the no-no list. And there are some journaling prompts in there. We're going to talk a little bit about how emotions play into all of this because I'm a coach. We talk about emotions here. And then I thought it'd be fun to include some of my favorite go-to recipes. So I put a handful of recipes at the end. These are things that I make every week. Um, some of them almost every day I, I turn to, especially during the work, work week. So um, those are in there as well. So you can grab your copy of that. I've got the link over here in the notes for this video. It's at kellyhanlonmccormick.com slash podcast slash 14, just the numbers one and four. So, okay, let's get going. I thought it would be easiest to start out today talking about a few things that we need to avoid when we're thinking we seriously want to shift our experience of stress and anxiety. So um, just as a caveat, just as a disclaimer here, nothing that you eat causes anxiety and nothing that you eat will cure anxiety. So I just want to put that out there. These are not quick fixes. These are not magic bullets. However, what you're putting into your body is important on so many levels. You know this, right? This is not new information. But where we're, when we're thinking about stress and anxiety, there are a few things that we really need to reconsider if, like I said, you're serious about overhauling your experience with stress and anxiety. So the first no-no is caffeine. How many of you just freaked out right now, right? Caffeine, especially when it comes from sources like coffee or when it's coupled with sugar, like sodas or energy drinks or like those designer coffee drinks from, you know, the places, um, those sorts of drinks are not good for us. So caffeine, we're not used to thinking about caffeine this way, but caffeine is a drug. It is a stimulating drug. It's legal. It's everywhere. We don't really think of it in terms of this. But caffeine has some serious side effects, right? It's one of the reasons that people use it all the time. They like some of the side effects. So some of the side effects are, I mean, what we, what we use it for, what we turn to it for is so that we have some energy, right? So that we can wake up, we can get through the morning or in the afternoon, it's like we can perk back up and then make it through the afternoon, right? So think about though, the sensations of what caffeine feels like in your body, right? Caffeine increases your blood flow. It increases your body temperature. Too much of it can make you nauseous. You can get jittery. You can get kind of shaky and icky. Um, it acts as a diuretic in your body. Caffeine has a lot of sensations, a lot of physical symptoms that go along with it. And some of us know our body's tolerance for caffeine really well, and you can ride that edge very well, and you may know exactly what that looks like. Other people, that fluctuates. It fluctuates with how much you've eaten. It fluctuates where you are hormonally. Maybe it fluctuates with how much sleep you have or haven't had right? So caffeine is something that, like I said, we use it really casually and we don't really think about it being a drug, but caffeine is a stimulant and it's a stimulating drug and we need to think about it that way. 
especially like I said, if you're really serious about shifting your experience with anxiety. So if you're somebody who loves caffeine and is sort of addicted to caffeine, well, if you're somebody who's sort of addicted to caffeine, let's talk. <laughs> if you're worried about getting through your morning or your afternoon without caffeine, I would like to talk to you, right? This is something that we can help you with in coaching. So if that's you, come over to the website, kellyhanlinmccormick.com slash coaching and book a free consult call with me and let's talk about caffeine and your addiction and your dependency on caffeine. Now, the rest of you, this is for all of you, um, what can you do instead? right? If you do need a little bit, what can you do instead? Now, I know, you know, I always have my favorite mug here and what I'm always drinking is tea. I don't ever drink coffee. I don't even drink decaf coffee. It just doesn't feel good in my body, but I do always have my tea nearby. And you may be thinking, well, wait, doesn't tea have caffeine? Yes, tea does have caffeine. Tea has far less caffeine than everything that we've just talked about. Coffee, soda, energy drinks, and those sugary coffee drinks that we get at all the places, right? It has far less caffeine than all of that, first of all. So that's an important note. Like one cup of black tea, which has the most caffeine out of the whole tea family, has about a third the amount of caffeine as a cup of black coffee. So that gives you kind of an idea. It does have some caffeine, but it's got far less than coffee. Now, the other cool thing about tea and why one of the, well, there's so many reasons why I'm such a tea advocate. One of the reasons is because it's got an amino acid called L-theanine. This is an all tea. And what L-theanine does is it kind of acts as a buffer that, that, that helps um, your body, it, it helps your body absorb the caffeine in a more time-lapse sort of way. So you don't get that rush and slam of caffeine that you do when you drink a cup of coffee or when you have an energy drink and all of a sudden like you can feel it right away. Tea is a lot gentler and it's because of this L-theanine. So you get the stimulating effects of the caffeine, but you also get the calming buffering of the L-theanine as you're drinking tea. So like I said, black tea has about a third the amount of caffeine as a cup of coffee. Then there's another category of tea called oolong tea, and oolongs kind of, they run the gamut, so it kind of depends how oxidized they are. A deeply oxidized oolong will have more caffeine, similar to a black tea. A lightly oxidized oolong will look and have the um, caffeine um, content more like a green tea, um, so oolongs kind of run, there's a spectrum. Then there's green tea. One cup of green tea has about the same amount of caffeine as a Hershey's Kiss. So this is it's tea that you can drink all day long. It's caffeine that will be gentle. It will be kind to your body. It will keep you going, but it's not going to give you that rush, that slam of caffeine, right? Like, like so many people are used to. And trust me, there are so many other health benefits to tea. We're going to do a whole episode about tea down the road. Um, I'm going to actually have a special guest come on for that one because I've got some special guests of my sleeve for future episodes. Um, but tea has amazing health benefits. And so you're getting all of those health benefits as you're drinking tea throughout the day. And if you're drinking something like a lightly oxidized oolong or a green tea or even a white tea, white tea is even more delicate and more subtle than green tea and has even less caffeine. You can sip on that all day long, all afternoon. I can have a cup of white tea right before bed and I have no trouble sleeping. And I'm somebody who's pretty sensitive to caffeine. There's no way I could sleep if I had a cup of black tea before I went to bed. My husband can do that no problem. But he's one of the coffee people. <laughs> but we love him anyway. Um, okay, so that's caffeine. And I wanted, like I said, in this... I want to give you some no-nos. I want to give you some things to avoid, but I also want to give you some great substitutes, some great alternatives, because I have found, and my clients have found, that it's really hard to just quit something. It's far easier to crowd something out. So if you've got something that's on the no-no list or something that you're trying to change or something that you're trying to give up, it's far easier if you crowd it out with something that you can have, something that feels good, something that's good for you. So I would try crowding out coffee with tea. 
And the wonderful thing about tea is there are so many different flavors. There's so many different kinds. So if you think you don't like tea, we just haven't found your cup of tea yet. So um, tea in the future. As you can tell, I love it. So go easy on the caffeine. No soda. No coffee. No energy drinks. Energy drinks are poison, folks. Okay, that's caffeine and chemicals. We shouldn't be having energy drinks. So does the same way. None of that. If you're a coffee person, I kind of get it. It's okay. We're going to start crowding it out with tea. Okay, so that's caffeine. Next up on the no-no list is sugar. Now, again, I know this isn't groundbreaking information, right? You're not surprised to hear me say that caffeine and sugar are not the healthiest things for you to be putting in your body. Sugar, there's a couple of things with sugar that are kind of interesting. So first of all, let's think about how come we crave sugar and how come we love sugar so much, right? If our ancestors, our cave people ancestors, they happened upon sugar in the form of like a bush full of berries, right? It happened very rarely. And when it did happen, they got the extra energy and the extra fuel from that little bit of sugar, that little bit of natural sugar that's in something like a berry. And they loved it and their brains loved it because they got that extra energy. They got that extra fuel from the berries, from the sugar. And so we have evolved, our brains have evolved into loving sugar. It was so rare. It was so hard to find. And the little bit that they found was great right? That little bit served their bodies. That worked. Now, in our modern luxurious life, right, you can walk into virtually any store because this is definitely not limited to grocery stores or food stores. You can walk into virtually any store at any time of any day and find obscene amounts of sugar, right? Whether it's candy, whether it's dessert, whether it's sugary sweet treats, or whether it's something like bread or salad dressing or ketchup, right? Granola bars, yogurt. There's a big one. Sugar is in everything these days. So when we think about crowding sugar out, and I'm going to tell you why it's so important that we're crowding this out and that we're really reconsidering how much sugar that we're having, Think about, there's so many things that you can DIY at home. Salad dressings, salsa, ketchup, any bottled condiment, super easy to do at home. And you know that whole Instant Pot craze we're all in right now? Now it's super easy to make your own yogurt at home, right? So there are things, granola is always easy to do, and it makes your house smell amazing. <laughs> really amazing. So there are things that you can do. There are things that you can sub so that you're not turning to sugary sweet treats. So that's why our brains evolved into wanting sugar, right? It was a rare thing. It gave good, right? Kylie says, we love the instant pot. Kylie and I have instant potted together numerous times and it's delightful. Um, Berries were such a rare sweet treat and it was such a small amount of sugar and it worked so well that our brains have evolved into loving it. Now, what happens when we have ridiculous amounts of sugar in our body is that our body has to produce hormones in order to neutralize that sugar high and that sugar low that we go through. We ride that roller coaster of the high and the crash all day with sugar. And our body has to release hormones in order to neutralize and deal with all that crap, right? So one of the hormones that our bodies release in order to deal with sugar is adrenaline. Now, adrenaline is a key component in the stress response, i.e., adrenaline is a key component in anxiety and panic attacks. So when we are riding this roller coaster of sugar highs and lows, sugar highs and crashes, right, and you're needing more sugar, and then you're feeling that tired slump because the sugar is wearing off, and then you have more sugar, and your body's riding that wave, your body is continually releasing hormones, one of them being adrenaline, in order to neutralize everything and deal with all of that nonsense, right? That's some biochemistry we're not gonna get into today. But when you're constantly releasing adrenaline into your body, you're like inviting anxiety in. It's asking for the stress response to get kicked off. This is not what we want to do, right? This is unnecessarily invoking stress and anxiety and panic in our bodies, all because of what we're eating. 
And a lot of us, if we're kind of wired for anxiety, you're probably scanning your body for things that look like anxiety, sensations, symptoms that kind of look like the beginning stirrings of anxiety. And sugar, similar to caffeine, has a lot of that shakiness, that tension, that jitteriness, sometimes nausea that goes along with it that also mimics anxiety. So here you are putting something in your body that stimulates a hormone, adrenaline, that creates the stress response. It goes right along with the stress response. So you're kind of putting yourself artificially into anxiety anyway, but the other symptoms, the other side effects of having things like caffeine and sugar in your body mean that as your mind kind of scans your body looking for anxiety, you're artificially thinking you're anxious when you're not anxious. You're thinking you're anxious when you're riding a sugar high. You're thinking you're anxious when you're going through caffeine withdrawal. You're thinking you're anxious when you've had too much caffeine. And so you get more anxious because you think you're already anxious. So there's multiple ways that we artificially create panic and anxiety and added stress to our lives by consuming things like caffeine and sugar. So these are the two big no-nos that we are talking about today. And like I said, where sugar is concerned, it's in everything. Read your labels and just remember anything that looks like a flowery, fluffy deliciousness, that turns into sugar in your body, okay? So it's not only what the label says and how much sugar is actually in it, it's what it turns into in your body. How does your body use that food as fuel? How does it break it down? So anything flowery, you can kind of write off as sugar, okay? So no caffeine, no sugar. We're subbing in things like tea, black, oolong, green, white tea, all have some amount of caffeine, but they're buffered with the amino acid L-theanine so that it's a far gentler approach to having caffeine in your body. And with sugar, we're looking for whole fresh fruit so that you're getting all of the fiber, just like the cave people right? And then there's other alternatives. And I've got some good recipes for you in the downloadable this week. There's some good recipes that'll give you some alternatives to some sweet treats that have some natural sweetness to them. One of them has a lot of cacao in it. And I don't know about you, but if I have chocolate, I feel completely satisfied. <laughs> I don't care if it's the sweetest thing or not. So in the downloadable, you can grab that kellyhanlonmccormick.com slash podcast slash 14. Okay, so the next thing to talk about is alcohol. But alcohol is so important. We're doing a whole episode just about anxiety and alcohol next week. So know that it's on the list. Know that it's a huge no-no for stress and anxiety. A lot of us drink because we're stressed and anxious, right? We're going to go into all of it next week. It's such a big topic. It's something I'm so passionate about. It gets its own episode. So that's coming next week. Episode 15 will be solely about anxiety and alcohol. So something else I wanted to talk about is, and this is also included in the download, is there's some journaling prompts in there so that you can start finding some clarity around how you use food, namely sugar and caffeine, right? Those kinds of foods as a way to help yourself emotionally. There's a lot of us that may not identify as emotional eaters. I didn't identify myself as an emotional eater. But if you think about the most extreme or the most important or the most special occasions, it becomes pretty clear that all of us have our emotions tied up in some respect, right? Some people are like, oh, I know. I always eat when I'm stressed. I eat when I'm happy. Some people know that they're totally an emotional eater. Other people, and I was one of these people, it was a little more subtle. It was something like, okay, well, if, you know, it's somebody's birthday, it's my kid's birthday, right? And what are we going to do if we don't have a birthday cake? Like, what do you mean we're not going to have sugar, right? There's a lot of people who, if I say, okay, we're going to go through the workday without caffeine, you can't have coffee anymore, right? There's going to be no more caffeine in your coffee. People are, start freaking out right? This is where we start realizing our emotions are involved with what we're consuming. Think about dinner parties. If you're the person who's saying, no, no caffeine, no, no sugar, right? I just want the olive oil and balsamic on my salad. No dessert for me, right? And then, and again, we'll get into this next week, but think about being the person who doesn't drink alcohol. 
being at the party, being at the networking event, being at the um, you know, New Year's Eve party, right? Hosting a dinner party and not drinking alcohol. We start realizing just how very much our emotions are tied up in our food and drink choices. So I've got some journaling prompts in the guide this week to help you kind of find some clarity there and just see where you might be tied up where you didn't think you were tied up emotionally around food. It's interesting to look at and it's really important to, to open your eyes to. So like I said, there's also a few um, recipes, things that I use every week, if not every day. So enjoy those, come on over and grab those. And if you want any help with this, if you wanna talk through any of this specifically, Come on over, kellyhanlonmccormick.com slash coaching. You can schedule a free mini session with me and we can dig into it. Let's talk about how you are using food emotionally or how you freaked out when I said no more caffeine, no more sugar, and that includes flour, right? Let's dig into it. Let's see what's going on there and let's come up with a plan. When we have a plan and when we start crowding things out, this isn't about just giving things up and depriving yourself. This is about crowding things out with really great stuff, stuff that really will support your body so that your capacity for handling stress and anxiety is far greater, right? You're going to have more energy. You're going to have more mental clarity. You're going to just feel more equipped to deal with life because it's always going to come at you right? Life is just going to keep coming. And the, the better we eat, it's one of those foundational things that is sort of basic. And it may seem sort of obvious, but when you really think about how am I dealing with stress and anxiety? Am I eating at my stress and anxiety? Is the amount of sugar and caffeine that I'm eating, is that feeding into my experience of stress and anxiety? Am I making my stress and anxiety far worse because of what I'm eating? These are great questions to ask. And I tell you what, the people who are really serious about shifting their experience with stress and anxiety are going to be super willing to look at this and at least experiment. See what it feels like in your body. One last thing. If you're interested in really seeing what else works and doesn't work for you, right? There's, we can kind of make blanket statements like caffeine, sugar, flour, alcohol. These are no-no's. <laughs> we can make a blanket statement. We know for pretty much all human beings, those are things that don't work. From there, it's hard to say, okay, you can't have peanut butter, or you can't have red meat, or you can't have dairy, right? Some people it works for, some people it doesn't. So the other thing that I strongly recommend is doing a really organized, carefully planned, carefully thought out elimination diet stripping your diet clean of all of that stuff, eating super clean for a month or more, and then start slowly reintroducing things so that you can get closer to understanding your own bio-individuality, right? What works for you? Maybe red meat works for you, but maybe gluten doesn't. Or maybe dairy works for you, but um, you've got to cut all meat out, right? And it's only fish and eggs. So experimenting with these sorts of things will help you figure out what works for you. So we can make a few blanket statements, caffeine, sugar, flour, alcohol. Flour basically is sugar. So caffeine, sugar, alcohol, no. And then from there, be willing to experiment with your own body. Be willing to experiment with your own self. The most organized, well thought out elimination diet that I know of, and I've done it numerous times, I think I've done it almost 10 times now, is called Whole30. There's many, many books. They have a wonderful online community, so many resources. The newsletters are great. Melissa Hartwig is fantastic. She has a podcast, I think, that starts this month sometime. <laughs> Excuse me. She's wonderful. So check out Whole30. That's a great way to do an elimination diet and strip all the stuff that may be triggering you, that may be problematic for you. And this is physically and emotionally right? She really, her latest book is called Food Freedom. Well, her latest, latest book, I think is the slow cooker book, but there's a book in there called Food Freedom where she really goes into the emotional ties of food. And it's interesting to strip all of that stuff out for a month or more and start reintroducing it and just watch your brain go wild. Watch all the thoughts that come up. So fascinating. Okay. That's it for today. You guys grab your downloadable guide 
That's at the website slash podcast slash 14. You can schedule a free mini session with me if you want to go deeper into this one-on-one. -on -one. That's at the podcast or at the, um, I'm sorry, at the website slash coaching. And be sure to find episode number 14 of the Transforming Anxiety podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be back next week to talk about alcohol. I know that'll be so super popular. But it's worth listening to, guys. It's worth talking about. Okay, that's it for today. I hope you have an awesome rest of the week, and I will see you next time. Bye for now.